Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. This week, we take a look at the content industry in the Middle East with Mena TV's Nick Grande and Faraz Sayed, General Manager of Jordan's biggest independent TV network, Roya TV. And in a brand new regular show feature called Commissioner's Corner, I find out what new programme ideas UK TV's channels are looking to acquire with Helen Nightingale, Senior Commission Editor at the network. And you can also hear how my programme pitch went. Don't forget to sign up for our new free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed and exclusive insight and opinion, including The Secret Producer, our anonymous exec reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. We're taking a look at the Middle East and North African region on this week's telecast, and I'm joined by Nick Grande from Mena TV in Dubai and Fariz Sayer, General Manager of Roya TV in Amman, Jordan. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much, Justin. I've been meaning to focus on Mena, or Middle East, North Africa, for a long time, as it's a region that I really find fascinating, although, to be honest, I struggle a bit to fully understand it. Coming to you first, Fariz. Can you tell us a little bit about Roya TV? Give us a bit of a background to the network and a little bit of what the future holds for the network. Okay, Roya TV is a privately owned uh, TV station. It was launched in 2011. It's based in uh, Jordan and broadcasting uh, from Jordan through uh, Nalsa and several other dish networks, uh, along with, of course, the online live stream and the video on demand. Uh, along the years, thankfully, after about six, seven years, we became the most viewed uh, TV station in Jordan, reaching about 30% daily uh, viewership. Uh, and across the years, you know, we have been uh, investing a lot in distributing our content and publishing it on uh, several social media platforms, our online platform. And uh, uh, the business has become mostly, I would say, now our reach has, has uh, become quite wide across uh, online, not only in Jordan, but also to the Arab world and many other countries. So, uh, uh, you know, starting as a TV station and, uh, you know, people keep saying that uh, TV is dead or linear TV is dead. Uh, and, and I think what is dead is actually the brand is dead. you know, uh, being a TV station sounds quite classical and old. So what we've been trying to do is invest more online and, We have basically now created, we're about to launch uh, uh, a media group, which uh, basically the TV becomes part of uh, uh, this group of media network. And we're utilizing the content that we produce on our TV, where we have currently uh, a news website and app, uh, a cooking uh, website and app, a kids, uh, a SVOD, a woman lifestyle website and app, as well as uh, there's a small e-commerce website that's basically serving uh, handcrafts and homemade products. Also, in order for us to get to this point, we had to do a lot of things on our own. So we had to come up with our own formats. So we had launched a, a dedicated company, just to, it's called the Creative Lab, which basically uh, does all the IPs and formats creation. Uh, and also we invested in, in, in managing talents and influencers. We also did a company for that. And we also had uh, the production house who was doing most of the, uh, the production for our content. A couple of years ago, we had uh, also had done the media training academy. So, you know, which would help our team to get trained and also try to train uh, people in the media scene. So just to give us an idea of the Jordanian TV landscape, you're the only independent network. Is that right? Well, there are quite a small number of very few other independent privately owned, but they are not, uh, they're barely viewed, I would say, maybe 0.05% of the population. So they're quite insignificant. The rest, there are two uh, stately owned uh, TV stations. One is dedicated for news and the other is just general entertainment. Uh, so basically, this is the landscape and the rest of the business, the media scene is split between, you know, the classical newspapers, uh, uh, news websites and outdoor radio. Nick, coming to you, tell us a bit about Mena TV. 
I started off in the uh, Arab world back in 2000. I used to work in the 90s in, uh, in Viacom. Um, so I had a corporate background and came into a pay TV environment in, in uh, Middle East through what was then Showtime. And uh, so I kind of learned the industry through the eyes of pay TV, but then set up a business um, 12 years ago, initially consultancy. It was a company called Channel Sculptor. Um, quite quickly realized, though, that uh, there was a need. There was a huge growth in TV channels and networks, and there was a need from the telecom side to try and organize the, the, the landscape for them because there were just hundreds of channels and they couldn't engage with them all. So we found ourselves in the sort of 2013 to 14 period licensing TV channels like Roya TV, like Dubai TV and uh, Saudi TV, a lot of the Egyptian channels, as well as internationals. We built up this portfolio of regional channels and working with Do, with uh, Vodafone, with uh, Saudi Telecom, Mantel, the, the various t telecoms operators. And so through that process, we kind of learned the industry from the buy side. We had data as well through the operators. We were able to see audience data. And at some point, we started organizing get-togethers for the CEOs of the TV networks, the telecoms, and even the streaming networks. This was sort of at 2016, we started doing that. And through that, I realized that there was a gap. There was a, a fundamental misunderstanding between the international vendors and the regional buyers. I think the vendors all assume that there are basically four or five major buyers in region. The TV networks here don't really know how to engage with the the international industry, and in fact, even the regional industry. I mean, so many times when we were organizing the Leaders Summit, we were people were meeting each other for the first time because, of course, MENA is 21 countries. You know, it's it's a huge area and culturally very di diverse. So that's how the idea for MENA.TV came about. You know, we set it up originally in partnership with Discop. You know, they were coming to the region for the first time, and we brought all our buyers to their show. And then we we found ourselves doing... Similar things for DICM, which is another regional show, working with uh, NatP, where, where you and I first met, working with MIPCOM as well, sort of bringing um, high power execs to, uh, to speak at MIPCOM. And, you know, in the middle of it all, there was this need to create a safe place where the buyers could uh, see what's available in the market and where vendors from around the world could show their wares. And that's how Mina.tv came about. Did you say 21 or 22 countries in uh, the MENA region? <laughs> it's hotly disputed. I think, uh, you know, you can, you can get anything from about from 18 up to 21. I think some of the countries, some countries don't even consider they exist. Let's say 2021 is, is about right. But we're talking about the Arabic speaking world. So typically, we don't include Turkey and Israel, for example, within MENA, whereas we would include um, Morocco, um, Iraq, and obviously the, uh, the Gulf states and uh, the Levant more generally. So what are the key markets then? Well, at the moment, the industry has been living for the last sort of 25 years via satellite. The footprint covers the whole market. And so what that's meant is a very homogenized content space, you know, where uh, broadcasters like NBC, Ratana, uh, uh, Dubai TV are sort of hitting a large uh, area. But within that, they're looking economically at ad sales and the biggest ad sales opportunity is the country with the biggest GDP per capita and, and, a, and a big GDP, which is Saudi Arabia. So everything tends to start with Saudi. Um, the next biggest economy, just from the sheer size, I mean, we're talking about 100 million people, is Egypt. And then after that, probably it's UAE, but, uh, it, but UAE is quite a, a diverse population. It's harder to, to monetize in the ad space. Um, and it's also more of a pay TV opportunity because it's a, an IPTV market. It's not solely cable a solely satellite but there are lots of undeveloped opportunities i think uh, morocco algeria for example are significant markets which are just sort of starting to show their potential uh, markets like iraq um, of course jordan where where faris is, is is a growing population it may not be big in terms of gdp but it's big enough to be interesting and uh, bahrain kuwait oman there's quite a few out there but they all tend to sort of take second fiddle to, uh, to Saudi and, to some extent, Egypt and UAE. Faraz, we, we talked a little bit about your VOD ambitions for Roya TV. How about the SVOD and AVOD market 
in the region as a whole? Or uh, are we still looking at uh, more regional services that are available across the region? How, take us through the SVOD and AVOD market there. Well, it's uh, still now it's still a version market, I would say, uh, especially that uh, there's still a very small number, percentage of people that actually are willing to pay for content. This is a major problem that it's going to take long years uh, to change. Uh, we're noticing that, you know, the, the Netflix kind of made, made a, maybe, maybe, maybe a big impact and is convincing people to actually subscribe. But I think that's also changing because we're seeing a lot of piracy going on. Uh, even on Netflix content, you're kind of, you're starting to see it on pirated IP uh, receivers. Uh, so it's quite interesting. Now there's, there's still, of course, there's a lot of homegrown locally produced content that, which is giving an edge to a lot of local uh, SVODs or uh, AVODs in the in the region, uh, and and looking at Jordan is, is is an example. So you know those big players they don't have uh, local Jordanian content yet. That is something that can that we are supplying uh, quite heavily, and the quality of production is increasing year by year. So I don't know to what extent you know the big players are going to be able to fill the void, but I think they have their own. They're they're offering their own kind of content, and I think the small players such as us are going to be offering our own unique content. So, tell us about your target audience. Considering it's an advertising based market, I mean, having things broadcasted for free through satellite that's it's been like that for decades. Uh, so, um, and, you know, as, even though we we broadcast across the MENA region, but uh, we're targeting Jordanians and Palestinians in Jordan and in Palestine, and also abroad. Uh, Yet we do monetize, if you're talking about our linear TV, we do monetize mostly, I would say, 80% of our revenues, if not 90% of our revenues, are coming to directly to be communicated to the Jordanian market. Uh, In terms of online, the the, the things, it's completely different. You know, uh, actually revenues from Jordan are coming about only 20%. So we have 80% come from different markets because our content is traveling, uh, uh, even though our content is Jordanian. But there's a lot of, uh, uh, because of the, the language that's being acceptable by many different Arabs, uh, uh, even though there's a difference in dialects. Uh, but because we have a good chunk of content that is uh, uh, suitable for uh, women in general, if we were talking about lifestyle or food or so on, such content travel, and that's where we uh, try to monetize in different countries. So when it comes to the export of Jordanian content across the region, do you think that Jordanian content is the most exportable out of all the Arab languages and dialects that that you know gives it the opportunity to travel better within uh, Middle East and North Africa? Uh, in terms of dialect, it is possibly the most suitable uh, it comes down to the content itself is it suitable or not suitable this is the issue where we try as much as possible to produce content that is uh, suitable and can can travel across so nick how do you see the streamers across the region how do you see that market developing well i think as faris alluded to it you know we're in a market that is not used to paying for content but what's interesting is there's a lot of new money coming in regionally you know, in the same way that we see massive investment from the likes of Amazon, Netflix, obviously, um, and globalizing that that production that they create uh, into revenue. Here in the region, we've got telecoms operators like uh, Saudi Telecom um, investing heavily in Jawi. We've got um, uh, businesses like Stars Play who are, um, you know, reliant on studio content. But again, they've got GE as one of their investors, Stars, obviously. Um, but then probably... We can't ignore NBC and what they're doing in the streaming space. I mean, Shahid, um, with, for the longest time, was a bit, a bit like BBC iPlayer. It was basically a catch-up service. But now um, it's much, much more than that. They've done deals with studios. You know, they have a major deal they announced last year with Disney. Um, and you can see that they are their subscription product is going to become a major um, route way in. And it's quite encouraging from from my point of view to see that because there is this danger that, that YouTube will just eat the free space and uh, Netflix and uh, Amazon and Disney will eat the pay space without these players. And the list does go on. I mean, I, I think uh, of, if I could probably give you about 20 different names of streaming networks that are launching. There's a big viewing audience in streaming here for the local net- networks. How about 
sales and acquisitions with the Middle East and North African region. What are the opportunities for international media businesses selling content into MENA? It's been a really turbulent period in MENA over the last sort of five years because of the politics. Turkish drama in particular was a huge uh, import and took up an awful lot of mind space with the viewers. And then suddenly we had this change of direction from the Saudi administration that saw a total ban on, on Turkish content, which affected the major audience drivers, you know, NBC, um, Dubai TV, and, and, and these, these broadcasters. And in fact, the, the whole GCC um, broadcasting scene changed. And there was, a, was and still is a big question mark about where, what are the opportunities that exist from a buyer's point of view? You know, is it Korean? Is it South American? Is it something from Europe? You know, Spain, for example. Like, where where should we be looking for new new audience opportunities? And I think there's a, a constant experimentation. In the meantime, there seems to have been a, a softening of the relations, such that Turkish content seems to be making its way back in, and it's been hugely popular um, here, as it of course it is in, in many other global markets. So on the drama side, um, it's really a bit of a, a free-for-all. The other thing on the drama side, which is really important, is you're seeing big-scale productions being made in Saudi now um, and in Egypt, of course, continuing on. But Saudi in particular, NBC, um, under their new ownership are, um, or their change in ownership where the government has a more of a, an active role, they're, they're putting a lot of money into, uh, into drama production locally there and and others are sort of following suit up to a point i think outside of the scripted stuff um kids content is always in demand um documentary content similarly um i think uh faris pointed to the fact that lifestyle content is travels well particularly women's content but there's this challenge that everybody faces which is how do i pay for the dub you know if i'm going to be dropping eighteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars an episode um, that could easily outweigh the cost of the uh, the asset itself, on, um, and you know, for Mina. So, the economics plays a part, and which is why you often hear smaller networks um, not willing to uh, to invest in international content. So, I think my message to the vendors would be, you know, think creatively about how you can overcome that. Because remember, there are hundreds of buyers in the region, not just the sort of the four or five that you're used to talking to. When you say think creatively, how would that manifest itself? I've been thinking a lot about this just even today in advance of this conversation, because there's always been a debate about dubbing versus subtitling, for example. Because we do audience measurement, we can see clearly that the dubbing does work. You get a big jump in audience uh, engagement through dubs. But equally, people are getting more and more used to the the Netflix experience. And I think, speaking as a viewer, I quite like to have the original language track. And so uh, subtitling, people are going to be getting more and more familiar with it. Certainly with Hollywood movies, the the MENA audience has been used to subtitling for, for many years through channels like NBC2. So my question, first question would be, would it be possible to start to rely more on subtitling and maybe rely on more on uh, uh, computer generated subtitling you know having a lighter touch in terms of the the uh, the um, review of that um, I'm sure that a lot of the dubbing and subtitling houses will be wincing at this but I'm just thinking about the economics here dubbing is expensive the other thing is if you are looking at at having a full scale dub who pays for it should that be uh, paid for by the the buyer um, and then done as a as a deal where the rights remain with the vendor um, for for uh, the, you know there might be economic models that will allow for that hurdle to be overcome so that it works for everybody. So I mean I don't have all the answers, but I think that this is a really important area because it, it's the thing that will open up the market. I mean I can't stress it enough that there are potentially three hundred four hundred buyers buying companies in this in this region that uh, m- the majority of which don't even know their buyers. Faraz, you talked about your, you obviously must have developed quite a sophisticated production infrastructure now. Presumably, as we go forward, more and more international productions may become reliant on local production businesses uh, such as yours. Is that something that you see as a, a growth area, being able to be the local production partner for any 
content that's been produced that features Jordan, for example? Definitely, there's potential. Uh, uh, and that's something actually we're working on uh, quite for some time now. We're going to have to minimize the gap between our quality and the expectation of those big, you know, big producers who are coming here and, and wanting some content. It is very essential that they don't only bring in their teams. They have to, of course, you know, have partners uh, uh, on the ground. And it is, quick, you know, a bit related. I don't want to say to censorship, but it's related to, to, uh, to the culture. You know, if you're coming to Jordan and try to produce something coming out of Jordan, you need a Jordanian to be involved in the project. But if you're going to bring a Lebanese and have a Jordanian product, that will never work out. Uh, so we're trying as much as possible. You know, we're doing. We have uh, we have produced a couple of uh, short drama series, and the main goal is to, you know, produce, do mistakes, and try to try to make our production better. So when we're ready to, for an example, possibly produce something for Netflix, or it could be Amazon Prime, or it could be Apple Plus, you know, we have to be ready for that when they are in need uh, uh, for such services. If I was a production company in the UK, for example, and I wanted to do a feature in Jordan, the cost may be a prohibitive and also travel with coronavirus and our ability to move around the world. Is that something that you can offer? Can you offer on the ground remote production, for example, if I'm if I'm sat in London and I can uh, I can look at a screen and direct from London with a with a crew on the ground. Is that something that Roya TV's production business can offer? Yeah, that's that's certainly one of the things. And uh, you know, this is supposed to be happening even before COVID. You know, uh, uh, because co production is very is very important. You know, we have to become more efficient. And we have to cut costs. And and uh, as a matter of fact, and because we have done a lot of uh, projects across the region, not only in Jordan, we have a good network of producers across. And it for countries in the MENA region where we can actually have uh, such production happening in different countries. And uh, some of our travel shows actually was done by three different production houses, you know, us and another two in, in two different countries. So it is it is quite easy to do. Uh, there's just going to be ha- a higher level of coordination uh, so you can get the same level of uh, production quality and the same picture across uh, these different productions. So how does censorship affect the Middle East and North African region? Well, it is different from one country to another. So uh, at least I can speak on behalf of uh, maybe Jordan. There is no clear system or a clear you know, uh, procedure on how censorship is done. It is, it is quite clear for the uh, feature films, you know, in the theaters. Uh, you know, it goes through a process, a screening process and so on. But when it gets to TV, they tell you, you know, you, uh, you air things and then we'll tell you if it's okay or not. Uh, and, and this is a major problem because, you know, in the law, there are a couple of couple of things that's quite clear what you can't talk about. But in reality, those things are actually become a very long list of things that you can't talk about. And it changes across time. You know, it depends who is the minister or it depends who is how the politics changing the country. So it's a it's an ongoing change of uh, self-censorship that you have to keep doing and updating your policies based on what's happening in the country. Which is uh, which is quite uh, tough and and uh, uh, tough to plan. Tough. I'll give you a quick example. You know, we had parliament elections a couple of months ago, and we wanted uh, uh, we had a plan to produce a very short drama series about elections. Uh, unfortunately, we had to put that on hold because we didn't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, by the time we start shooting and by the time we finish shooting, and it was quite risky uh, to talk about some of the issues that we had in the script. So we decided to scrap it. Uh, so that's the kind of things that we had to go through, uh, along with, you know, uh, uh, some incident that happened uh, uh, last year that uh, uh, that was quite unfortunate during COVID, you know, where governments, uh, many governments took the chance of suppression and oppression and then and, and try to put the media, uh, 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 you know, try to censor a lot of things that shouldn't be shouldn't be censored. And this is something that you have experienced firsthand, reporting things that perhaps the government didn't really want you to. We had to go through uh, the news uh, chief and I, uh, we were detained uh, back in April uh, 2020 for about three days for a very simple uh, piece of news that was done in the street, just asking uh, uh, freelance workers about their situation, especially during the lockdown, where they didn't have much, uh, you know, any income. And 
And unfortunately, during that, that period, you know, we were doing a lot of investigative news and proving that the government wasn't making and taking the necessary precautions and measures, uh, which we had proved on many occasions that they were lying and giving wrong information, uh, which led to, you know, a big clash. And uh, we ended up getting detained and uh, jailed for about three days up until, you know, we had to, uh, you know, pay bail and uh, and get out, uh, out of that <laughs> misery. Being able to second guess what the government will or will not allow from a news perspective is really important. It is it's the politic, politics games, you know, if you, uh, and, and which makes it hard for such a country in Jordan where the government changes quite often. So by the time you kind of build good relations with the government, uh, from a political point of view, uh, it changes. And, and uh, it, it, it's a matter of luck. Are you facing someone who's open-minded, who, has, uh, who supports freedom of speech, or someone the complete opposite? And during that time, I think we had one of the worst governments, and we had COVID. So it was quite difficult to predict what they wanted, and uh, uh, it led to such, uh, such an end. Nick, how do you think censorship affects the region when it comes to the binding and selling of content? I think it is an evolving situation. And, you know, back in the, the, the early 2000s when I was at Showtime, we were very fortunate being behind a paywall that we could get away with quite a lot. But there was um, a great deal that couldn't be done in the free-to-air space. I think that one of the benefits of having more streaming solutions out there is that there is a, a bit more of a uh, general liberalization of content. Um, I think also what's happening, um, not only, uh, you know, in uh, North Africa, but also in, in the Gulf in terms of greater freedoms being ex- experienced and, and a gradual change in attitudes. Um, so that for the longest time, you know, screen violence was never really an issue in, in, uh, you know, all of the sort of the, the war stuff and the gun stuff was never a problem, but there was always an issue around more, sensitive topics uh, relating to relationships and so forth. I get the feeling that that's gradually becoming more relaxed now. How it works, as Farah suggests, you know, it, there's no global regulator. There is no Ofcom or uh, anything equivalent to it. So it really is a case of the market determining its own narrative. But I think YouTube has helped to open things up um, from that point of view. I think um, Netflix will do that as well. You know, it was very interesting to me that shows like Orange is the New Black were available on Netflix when it went uh, global. You know, they were available in MENA. And now it's that time of the show where my guests get to nominate their TV industry stories of the week. Nick, what's your story of the week? It's not a MENA story. I think it's so important, though, this Netflix Direct being rolled out internationally. You know, Netflix launching a linear channel service. Um, It's been trialling, obviously, in France since November and calling it a web experience that's the same for everyone who watches it. Maybe not in the mood to decide, or you're you're new and finding your way around. Um, So it could could also be used in the future to to turn the release of hotly anticipated episodes, drive audience to a show that's underperforming. You can see all of these benefits, Netflix. But it is slightly ironic, given that Reed Hastings famously said, on a number of occasions since 2013 that linear t- TV was dying and would be dead within 20 years. But it's not only Netflix. I mean, Watch Party on Amazon doing something similar. Maybe COVID's fueling, fueling this, you know, it's a common longing for communal bonding experiences. My question underlying all this, particularly for coming from Mina, is is Netflix direct a good thing or a bad thing for linear TV channels? Is it presenting a a way for the linear channels to remain relevant, or is it pre- presenting yet another reason not to, to use them? How about you, Faris? What's your story of the week? I think it would be uh, Viacom, CBS, and Dish Media. Uh, they delivered addressable ads uh, in live national broadcast TV. I think they just tested it and they announced it. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite interesting because, you know, being a business uh, who mostly the revenues are coming from Dish uh, satellite transmission, it is something that we definitely need. And uh, there are a few examples in the region who are actually trying to do addressable TV ads, uh, which we hope, you know, uh, we will get rolling pretty soon. So we'll be able to serve our clients uh, in a better way. And as more and more eyeballs are going towards SVOD, the ability to target advertising more effectively on commercial networks becomes more and more important and crucial, right, for the future of 
advertising on TV. Today, the advertisers just, you know, whenever they have a campaign, they keep comparing, uh, you know, their online advertising and how targeted it can be compared to TV, where it's just going nationwide. So it is quite crucial that within the next couple of years that we have some kind of solution and a technology where we can serve, you know, the online ads, just not any different from the TV ads. And now it's time for Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin, where my guests get to nominate who their Hero of the Week is and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Fares, who's your Hero of the Week? You know, it's actually, it's a, it's an Apple Plus TV show. It's called uh, Ted Lasso. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I watched it and it's quite inspiring. It's, a, it's such a great show with great script. Uh, I think it was launched back in October, but I've just seen it right now. Teaches a lot about leadership and it's quite inspirational. I do recommend that you guys give it a shot. And Fares, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Blockage of social media uh, platforms. You know, I'm not saying they shouldn't block Trump, but I think that's quite biased that there, you know, there uh, there are many others that could be blocked. And if they're going to start blocking things based on their own policies, I think this is this is quite dangerous uh, because there are many other, you know, out there there are many terrorists and there are many. Uh, people that should be blocked and uh, it is quite interesting how they're making their own decision of who to block and who 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 not to block it's a key point really for news distribution and opinion and influence right around the world again that's something that's a, a developing story nick who's your hero of the week this week despite their woeful lack of action on climate change it has to be the australian government for standing up for the commercial rights of news providers and challenging the search hegemony of uh, of Google. So, yeah, seeing Scott Morrison saying Australia doesn't respond to threats, I realise it's a really complicated story, but I think it's so important that uh, a small economy, de- democratically elected economy like Australia does this, they can provide a signal to to other liberal economies to be thinking about the same I think it's potentially a pathway to a more commercially viable news industry where we journalism is actually rewarded. As Faraz said, you know the the whole issue of news regulation and uh, an influence that social media networks have got is uh, has got to be the you know one of the main developing issues of the year. So hopefully something that we can uh, that can be addressed. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Well, I realise all our stories up to now have been international stories. I think. There's still an international element to this. I want the centralized uh, management teams of the the big TV networks to get in the bin this week because I'm so sick of seeing really good management teams regionally being let go and replaced with centralized management, sort of often covering three or four territories. I realize there's cost implications that are behind this, but I think it's also a case of Turkey's voting for Christmas. I think that... uh, there's a whole generation of really important knowledge which is being let go at a critical time um, in the industry. So it's, it's just frustrating to see that. Well, I've worked in Viacom in the mid-90s, as I think mentioned before, and during my four years there, we did a centralization, we did a regionalization, and another centralization. This stuff is just normal, but I would like to see um, the networks look after their regional teams. The shift from networks to becoming more digital focused is perhaps not really helping that? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. I mean, you know, I look downstream, what's going to the industry going to look like in two years time, you know, when Disney's renewal with OSN comes up and and so forth. It's going to be a model which is more and more run out of Los Angeles and London. You can see that. For a vibrant industry to exist, doesn't matter what region you're in, you need to have an engaged uh, management of of your media assets working directly with the audiences and understanding them and especially Amina where there are so many cultural differences and nuances so uh, I really hope that uh, that we don't see a sort of a too much of a gravitational pull towards the HQs. Really interesting to hear that Nick and Fares thank you so much for both of you for joining us this week it's been really really interesting to hear about Middle East and North Africa we could obviously dedicate a whole couple of weeks shows to looking at all the various different diverse countries and communities within such a massive region but it's really nice to just focus on it just for a moment nick fares thank you so much for joining us again and good luck and hope to see you in the flesh very soon 
Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And now it's time for a brand new feature on the show called Commissioner's Corner, where we catch up with a leading network or streaming executive to find out the latest on their content needs. And to kick off the series, I'm delighted to be joined by Helen Nightingale, Senior Commissioning Editor at UK TV, home of channels including Dave, W, Gold and Yesterday. Helen has exec produced on shows across the network and has commissioned the award-winning Emma Willis Delivering Babies and Women on the Force for W, Cops on the Rock for Dave and Secrets of the Transport Museum for Yesterday. Welcome to the show, Helen. Thank you very much. Great to have you on. How are things at UK TV? How are you keeping things going during this <laughs> lockdown three? How does that affect the process of commissioning? Because obviously everything you're doing is, is via Zoom, presumably. It's all via Zoom. I mean, everything is, you know, we're, we're all working remotely. And it. <laughs> listen, it was harder when we first started, you know, back in March, because we were all a bit like, oh, God, what's the technology? And I can't see you and I'm on mute and et cetera. We know all the jokes. But we've sort of settled into it, actually. And what I what I what I think now is really interesting is it, you know, I, I mean, I've been a producer for many years. And I have been a commissioner uh, for five years at UKTV. And I thought that being in a room together, you know, literally being in a, actually in real life in a room together was um, w- was so important to the process. But actually, we can do it like this. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. I'd love to be in a room with somebody else. Right yeah. now. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. my immediate family because we're all going crazy. But but you can do it. It's great, actually. I, I rather like it. Do you know what I was most worried about was um, was pitching? So pitching on. So the process is you, the, you, the producer, bring me the idea. I like it. We develop it together. I then have to sell it on. So I sell it firstly to the channel uh, directors um, and my team, my sort of factual and fact in team. We then pitch it on to um, Richard Watcham and, and Steve North, um, who make the final decision alongside the channel directors. And I was anxious about pitching on Zoom, but you just sort of get, you get used to it. I mean, it's weird what we can get used to. Humans are so adaptable. Well, that's interesting. And I guess that's a bit of a relief to producers, right? Because they must have the same thing pitching to you and pitching to your team. It's like, you know, how can we communicate, you know, how passionate and excited we are on this project and really sort of communicate the key points Mm -hmm. when you're not in the room? As you say, we're adapting. We try to be as as relaxed about it as possible, actually, you know, we've just been, you and I have just been having a chat about, you know, it being a sort of relaxed conversation. And so we tried to do that uh, with the producers just so that it didn't feel weird because it felt weird enough as it, as it was. I, I commissioned quite a lot, actually, during the lockdown. I developed and commissioned quite a lot, as did my colleagues. UK listeners are obviously very familiar with UK TV, but for our international listeners who may not be quite as familiar, can you give us a really quick rundown of the network's channels and the audiences and your role? So uh, UK TV is the network and the channels within that are Dave, Gold, W, Drama, Alibi, Eden and Yesterday. Um, And the programmes across the network span comedy, entertainment, natural history, factual and drama. Um, we commission on uh, Dave Gold W Alibi, but not me. I'll talk about that in a minute. And yesterday, so currently we don't commission on Eden, which is off Natural History Channel. My role is senior commissioning editor, Factual and Factent, which is actually and Factual Entertainment, which is actually quite is quite broad. I commission across all the commissioning channels. So that's Dave Gold W. And yesterday, so they're all the factual channels and the comedy channels. So don't talk to me about something like hypothetical. Talk to my brilliant colleague, Ian Coyle, about something like that, because he'll be really interested in something like that. But that's not for me. On Dave, for example, I've just commissioned a show called Cops on the Rock, which is following the Royal Gibraltar Police, which is actually part of the UK police force it just happens to be in Gibraltar so if you're going to think about Dave think about factual or yeah factual or fact end on Dave. So how much original content do you commission per year across all those channels? We're commissioning more shows than ever this year actually and we've got 147 shows on our slate some of those are in production um, and some of those are in development so that's the the biggest commitment to commissioning that we've ever done. 
And is that a result of the pandemic or is that just generally an increase in original commissioning that you've been moving more towards? It's a combination of both, to be honest. Some shows we weren't able to deliver in, in 2020, understandably, just like every other broadcaster on the planet. But the commitment at UK TV is to more original content going forward. Can you just give us a flavour of what's currently working particularly well on specific channels that might give producers a bit of an idea of, okay, that sort of idea or in that sort of an area, but maybe with a twist, might sort of work? Yeah, of course. No problem. So I'll start with W, just because it really is my sort of heartland. You know, I'm a factual and fact I was a producer and now I'm a commissioner and I exec all those shows. So uh, W is a female skewing channel. It's actually, it's in pay of the commissioning channels, Dave and Yesterday are in free. But W and Gold, I'll talk about Gold in a second, but W and Gold are are behind the paywall. We need to offer premium content on W. Our most successful show is Emma Willis Delivering Babies, which I commissioned. It works because in the UK, Emma Willis is a really, she's a household name. You know, she's a really, really well-known presenter. We went to her agent and said, if she was to come to W, what would she do? And the first sort of gambit from her was, I'd love to do something in the NHS. You know, my mother worked in the NHS. I grew up, my mother was a nurse. You know, I grew up with with that. And I feel really passionate about that. That was way before COVID, you know, way before we really saw the incredible work that the NHS are doing now. You know, this was this was a couple of years ago. So um, we then put that idea out to a couple of indies in the UK and we said can you come up with something that Emma will be passionate about firecracker developed it and came back to us and said look she can't become a a midwife even though she's obviously really interested in birth she can't become a midwife because it just wouldn't work on a tele schedule and with her all her other commitments but she could train to become a maternity care assistant so we said okay fine well let's let's do that so they found a hospital and that's what she did it's been really successful because she is a lovely obviously a brilliant woman uh, she's passionate about it and that really works on w you know people doing things that they really care about it won a broadcast digital award two years running which is quite unusual the audience like it and my peers like it too so uh, that's exciting and that's been recommissioned doesn't it that's for that was recommissioned for a second series yeah so we've had two series of delivering babies and then last year we were about to go again and covid hit so we pivoted and firecracker came up with delivering babies in 2020 and that's on screen in in february so we made a a four-part series in looking at what it was like to have a baby in lockdown in the uk it's a gorgeous series that goes out next month and then one of our most successful shows is inside the ambulance so inside the ambulance is an observational documentary it is following paramedics It was pitched to us by Brown Bob Productions and they came up with a little twist. I mean, there's obviously been many, many shows about paramedics, but they came up with a little twist and said, what if we put a camera in the back of the ambulance and the front of the ambulance? So what you have is you have all the drama that goes on when they pick up their emergencies and they blue light them off to hospital. And that is obviously incredibly compelling and you know the stories are told beautifully by um by the producers at Bramble who just do a brilliant job but also what you've got is you've got the paramedics in the cab and you see them in between their jobs where they talk about you know what they're going to have for lunch and and the date they went on last night so it's a really nice mix of it's all human stories but but there's a really nice mix and and it was just a bit different I think if you just come and you know if somebody just came to us and said we've got access to X, Y, and Z ambulance service, it wouldn't have grabbed our attention in the way that that did. So I think what's really important for producers to know is that we want something that feels unique to us. W particularly is a pay channel and we need something that is going to draw the viewer over to our channel. Emma Willis was a big name inside the ambulance, very successful show on our channel it's just got a little bit of a twist. On a channel like Gold, we don't commission masses of factual because actually we commission a lot of scripted and I'll let another of my colleagues talk about that. That's not my that's not my wheelhouse. But we, we do commission some factual. 
So you take it to a show like Ricky and Ralph. Uh, Ricky and Ralph's great, very northern road trip. It's taking brilliant gold talent. So it's Ricky Tomlinson and Ralph Little. They played father and son in uh, The Royal Family. Hugely successful show. Also is constantly being watched on gold. We have the archive. So we take those two fantastic characters, funny, warm. They have a connection because they played father and son in, in the royal family. And uh, they went off together on a road trip up north just to extol the virtues of up north. It's a really gorgeous series. It's warm and funny and educational. Factual on gold has to speak to the archive. It's really important to us that we can play the archive around it. Also, it's important that, that, that there's some sort of connection to the channel on top of the archive. So we don't just want X piece of talent does x journey there's got to be some connection there it could be for example if there was a anniversary around dad's army for example or uh, another well-loved comedy classic that's playing on gold and there was an opportunity a production company came up with an idea to say okay it's the 40th anniversary the talent's still available and actually we've got an idea that plays to the original series but takes it on a bit or a different viewpoint on it that's the sort of thing that might be of interest. That's exactly right. Extremely well put. And how about yesterday? Because yesterday is much more around historical programming, isn't it? Yes, exactly. The way we sort of define yesterday is it's more about nostalgia and about facts. What we have found with that audience, that particular audience, it's a male skewing channel and it skews slightly older. What we have discovered about our audience when we talk to them is they like to know stuff. And we think, we don't know this for a fact, but we think that it's probably so that they can go down to the pub like we used to in the old days. Do you remember pubs? <laughs> um, they can go, <laughs> just vaguely, they yeah. can go down to the pub and go, you'll never guess what blah, 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 and they'll trot out a fascinating fact. The most successful show on on yesterday, the most successful commission on yesterday, rather, is a show called Bangers and Cash, which is an observational documentary series featuring a brilliant family who are an auctioneer, and they find classic cars, they do them up, and then they they sell them at auction, and and it's all sort of, you know, it's all part of this same precinct. Mm -hmm. So on yesterday... We only commission precinct-led observational documentaries. That's not entirely true because we also have the architecture of the railways built. But that's a bit of a it's a bit of a special case that because uh, my colleague Hilary Rosen was pitched Tim by Brown Bob, who also make Inside the Ambulance. They pitched Tim and the architecture of the railways built, which we knew would be and pre- has proven to be a compelling show for the SA audience. The reason we commission precinct-based docs is because of the price point. So the price point on yesterday is really low at the moment. That's because we're growing commissioning. It's only been commissioning for a couple of years. Before that, it was all archive and acquisitions and, and archive from the BBC. It's a really joyful channel to commission for. Well, it is for me. I've got quite a factual background, so I really love how deeply factual it can be, you know, and it can literally be looking at the gears inside of a car. I commissioned a show called Secrets of the Transport Museum, and there's not much I don't know about carburettors now, having watched all the shows. It does have to have elements of history, but we don't really like anything pre-World War II, so don't don't worry about pitching us the Stuarts or anything sort of before World War II. That's sort of our sweet spot. We've got a show called Warbird Workshop, which is on the channel, which is a commission. That's a gorgeous show about doing up World War II planes. Again, observational and uh, observational and factual. So characters are important to us, but the factual content is really important to us. Secrets of the Transport Museum is based at Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's Transport Museum. And it looks at, you know, cars, planes, buses, bikes, both motorcycle and push bikes. It's a really good precinct with lots of areas of interest to that audience, you know, the 45 plus. What do you mean by precinct? Oh, I mean a place, a place, a a, a hub. OK. Bangers and Cash is based at the auctioneers. Uh, Secrets of Transport Museum is based at Brooklyn's. So it doesn't have to be talent-led. It can be a compelling 
or, as you say, a precinct. As long as the characters are compelling, they don't need to be talent exploring an area that, you know, a hobby of theirs. That's exactly right. It needs to be not talent, in fact, because putting architecture of the railways built to one side, we are only commissioning observational documentaries. We don't want you to go and look for the celebrity who's passionate about archaeology at all. We want you to find precincts, places that might be of interest to that to that audience and look at the characters there. One of the things that when we pitch to the uh, channel director of yesterday is he always says, well, what am I going to see in episode 40? Because we commission in volume. So a series one will be 10, 10 by 60. Right. Then the, the idea is that with something like Bangers and Cash, for example, we keep commissioning those, you know, and, and we build up a real uh, vault of those shows. If you can't envisage what's going to happen in, in episode 40, then it's probably not right for us. And is that pretty much the same across all the channels? It's uh, it's basically a volume play. The, a producer should come to you with an idea that they can think about a fourth or a fifth series and an idea that's strong enough to deliver that sort of content on a on a large scale that's always helpful but uh, there are exceptions to that you know we don't commission emma willis delivering babies on w in volume yeah. but we do commission uh, inside the ambulance and 999, 999 rescue squad yeah. the other show that's coming this year which i commissioned last year and they shot last year during covid which is fascinating is women on the force so that's our female cop series for w we did one series and we've got another one coming and that if we can get it to work and that will become a volume piece for W as well. However, certainly on yesterday and certainly for that eight o'clock slot on W, volume is really important. Um, and just to say really important point on W, we, we don't want any more medical shows. We're not looking for any more medical shows. We've got a lot of shows that, that are coming back. So we've satisfied our, you know, our need for, for medical We're looking for fact-end formats. Okay. It would be great if the first series could be eight or ten. It would be great if it's a format that can repeat. If you think about fact-end formats for that channel, we're looking at predominantly female areas, but not exclusively. We do need them to be able to watch with other people, either their friends or their mum or their dad or their husband or whatever, you know. We're not looking for exclusively female content. So, so you know, a makeover show, it, it can't just be about, you know, female skewed subjects. It wants to be broader so that we can include men and, and women. That's really important to us. But the sort of tonality of that is it needs to be, it needs to be fun and keep the entertainment value up. It's got to have a sort of factual basis, if you, if you know what I mean. I think something like Emma Willis you know, one of the most important subjects on that we discuss on telly, birth. Giving birth is hugely dangerous. It's life-changing. We keep it funny and warm. It, it's not a show that sort of catastrophizes or or has false jeopardy. You know, it, it keeps the tone light and and warm. You know, we want to keep the entertainment value. So, so dating, um, although there are many dating formats on telly, so that's really tricky. Mm-hmm. But it is an area that's really interesting to our audience. Relationships. So how can we explore relationships without doing divorce parties? <laughs> we, we'd rather not start a show with um, Sarah and John are splitting up. How do we make their split better? You know, we don't do shows like that. You know, we don't do uh, we don't do social experiments on WA, but the subject matter needs to be important important enough to sort of be gripping and compelling so for example with w i don't know if there was an all-female trawler crew on a ship out of grimsby or 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 somewhere in devon is that the sort of thing you go "Mm, okay yeah that i can see that working on a volume basis would that be worth a significant future conversation for example or is it like nah that's really not the sort of thing that we would do it's really interesting that because if you if somebody did find an all female trawler crew, you should definitely bring it to me. That feels like we can tell an important story. Yeah. So you know, because it will probably be the first one in the world ever. You know, that's great press, isn't it? You know, um, but conversely, if you came to me and said, "There's a brilliant trawler 
crew operating out of, you know, wherever, Sidmouth. They're really good. There's a woman on there. Um, she's really, really good. Why don't we ask X five female celebrities to do time on a trawler crew? I would say that's not for us because that is very hand of the producer. If anyone knows of an all-female trawler crew, my email address is... <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Well, no, my email address is because I'm the producer on that now. OK. Yes, All right. absolutely. I'm so sorry. Everyone's heard, everyone's heard that here first. So co-productions, that must be an important element of your acquisition strategy. Yes, absolutely. So we have a, an entire acquisitions team who operates brilliantly and do and do what they do. We then have the commissioning team, which is, you know, when we fully fund things, we we deal with that. Basically, we'll always forge a partnership. Something like Expedition with Steve Backshaw, which is on Dave. That's a brilliant show with Steve Backshaw. And he goes to places where they've never shone a light before. They've never put a camera before. And in some instances, they think maybe, you know, no one's ever seen it before. So it, they go to lots of different locations. That was a massive budget. The safety protocols that had to be put in, in place sort of push the budget up as it is. Beautiful show. So that was for Dave, but that was a partnership with the BBC and with Fremantle International. So if you have a big factual show and you think, do you know what? This could be really brilliant for Dave. Now, let me tell you why that show works for Dave. Dave's a male skewing channel. Uh, That'll be no surprise to anyone who's ever seen the channel. It is essentially a comedy channel. It's the home of the biggest names in in comedy it's a it's a really good channel we do have factual on dave and especially if there are special things so the dave audience grew up with steve Backshaw. you know we we all remember deadly 60 you know and all those shows that, that steve did you know we all grew up with it so he was very familiar to that audience and then you put him in this extraordinary world where he's going places that no one's ever been before with a camera that is really compelling for a Dave audience. You know, that's aspirational. It's it's intrepid um, with a lovely, lovely host, you know, someone who's, who's great to spend time with. So if you have an idea and you think, wow, I've got this, you know, really big name um, who wants to do something that feels quite Dave, don't think I won't go there because they only commission 10 by 60 uh, for seven o'clock. Just come to us, bring us your big ideas and either have a thought about what the deal might be, talk to distributors, talk to other channels and see what the deal might be, or just come to us and we'll help. You know, we'll always work with people to get the very best uh, content on our channels. It's worth saying that also it's not only UK producers that work with UK TV. You commission from producers all around the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, less we commission less from people all around the world. But what I'm saying is people all around the world don't think you can't pitch to us. But it's really important that, that our shows have either a hugely international appeal. I mean, look at something like Border Force, which is on Dave, another really successful show. That is a volume piece. That's a deeply factual volume piece, a bit like I referred to Cops on the Rock, which is new. I commissioned it. The Gibraltar, the Royal Gibraltar Police series. You know, Border Forces is an observational documentary about the border, border between the, the US and, and Mexico. We commission that, you know, that, that is a commission. It's made by British people in the States. It is important that there is something about it which feels appealing to a UK audience. So there has to be an understanding of the UK audience, even if it's coming from a Canadian producer, for example. Absolutely. On the smaller budget. We work with distributors on the yesterday shows, for example, not not exclusively the yesterday shows, but yesterday shows where we have a more challenging price point per episode. All of those commissions, Bangs and Cash, Warbird Workshop, Secrets of the Transport Museum, Restoration Workshop, which is repeating at the moment, they all have significant contribution from distributors. Restoration Workshop, we're working with Drive, TCB Media, we're working with any of those distributors we will work with to make those budgets work. We talked about what you are looking for, the types of show that you are looking for, for Dave and and W, for example, and and yesterday. Can you give me, across those three channels in particular, what you're definitely not looking for? Because that may save everybody a lot of time, right? And you mentioned no more medical on W. 
was probably the, the main area. What about the other channels? Is, is there anything to say, um, absolutely, don't pitch me this? On Dave, don't pitch me comedy entertainment. That's not my area. I only look after factual and fact ends. Don't pitch me, you know, three comedians sit in a studio and do something because that's not right for me. We're looking for celebrity journey on on W if it is pa- their passion. My boss, Hillary, has this brilliant phrase, which is this, that and the other. So <laughs> if you picture something which is this, that and the other, it has to have a really strong narrative arc. It's got to have a really strong storyline on W. So we don't want magazine shows. Don't don't pitch us the alternative to uh, Leafs Women. That is a flipping brilliant show on ITV. It's not right for W. Actually, that highlights how important also it is about the individual that you're pitching to, isn't it? Getting the person right within the channel as well that you're speaking to, having those initial conversations with. First of all, what's the perfect pitch? Format, length, content, for example. And second of all, how does a producer make sure that they're pitching to the right person for that idea on that channel? So for me, and this is really personal, Justin, I don't want anything more than a page. If you're initially contacting me about an idea, I don't want more than a page. What I really like is some sort of good image that tells me what I'm going to get and a really strong selling paragraph and then a bit more detail and if you're sending me a format with format beats then by all means send me a beat sheet you know just a sort of outline of what the what the format beats are but I really don't want 12 pages of research it might not be right for us and then you've done all that work you know and I have to say no to the top line so I am really happy to get a top line and a paragraph that suits me if you have tape tape is always helpful uh, any sort of moving image is always going to attract our attention. And then in terms of getting in touch with us, we have a commissioning website. So we have our, our UK TV commissioning website. That will give you the channel brief. So that will give you a much more concise version of what I've just done. And then it will tell you which genre commissioner you should be getting hold of. So Hilary Rosen runs Factual and Fact Dent, and that team includes Helen Nightingale and Kirsty Hansen. And Ian Coyle is the head of entertainment, and he has a commissioner who reports to him called Mark Idden. And then there's the scripted people, which I'm not going to talk to you about because they're scripted. If you go to the corporate site, to the commissioning site, it will also give you our submissions email. In the first instance, if you're not sure who you should contact, then send it to submissions. They will then filter it down to us. All right. Well, we'll uh, include a link in the episode description to that website so everybody can access that information really easily. In terms of budgets, obviously, I know you can't be specific. And obviously, an Emma Willis fronted show is going to be a different budget from a Banks and Cash type show, for example. But can you give us an idea about what the budget range is per hour across those channels? That's a really difficult question. I'm not being evasive at all. It's just that it varies so massively, you know, hypothetical or the new show coming up on Dave, which is Mel Giedrich's Unforgivable. Those are very, very different to Secrets of the Transport Museum. Our budgets are in line with other broadcasters. And I don't want you to think about budget first. I want you to think creatively first. And by the way, just on ter- in terms of contacting, if you know me and you already know my email address, just send me your ideas. It's people who don't know me then, or, or any of our commissioners, please go through via the, um, the commissioning website. But if you know me, just send me your ideas because I'm always in the market for ideas. For every Mel Giedroich unforgivable we will have a cops on the rock on dave you know it's about getting the best content on the channel within that channel's budget if you have a big talent led factual adventure piece and you go oh gosh that's going to be so expensive i still want to know about it because if i don't think we can fund it i will very quickly tell you what i would hate is if you don't bring me your big ideas 
I just want the best ideas from the great producers out there, you know. I don't I don't want you to think about money first. I want you to think about creative first. Okay, so my trawler, female, all female trawler crew idea, I can come to you, but maybe I might put some feelers out there to see if there's any other networks like in the States or a Canadian network who may also be interested in that sort of thing. And I come to you and say, okay, I've got a Canadian channel. They're relatively interested. So there might be a budget split to happen here. Presumably that makes it much more attractive right from the get-go. And you might be able to give me a a yes quicker. When you bring in other parties, it always takes longer for everybody to sort of do the deal, you know, so it's, it's not always quicker. But it might get sort of promoted to the, you know, if we have a double tick system, you know, it might go to the double tick quicker because we know that there's funding in place. Listen, if you've got funding for something, it's always good because you're sort of ahead of the game. I'm going to suggest that probably the all-female trawler obstock is probably perfectly fundable from W on its own. I sort of can envisage what a show like that might cost because I'm a, I'm a producer, you know, I exec many shows before I came in here. As long as we have the UK premiere, then of course we'll talk to other channels, international channels, you know, or, or distributors. Yes, absolutely. And my last question, obviously in the middle of this pandemic, but when it comes to production and the challenges that we've got on production, obviously there is certain shows as well that there is an increase in cost isn't there some uh, a lot of people have said it's up to 20 percent but in terms of delivery as well so let's uh, put cost to the side for a second you know how important is the ability for a producer to say we can do this covid safe and we can deliver this by the end of june absolutely guaranteed presumably that timely production may be an advantage because of literally the fresh content that you're wanting to put on your channels. If I can produce my show, my trawler show for you by the end of June, absolutely, and it's, you know, and it fits within the budget, then that's going to make it more attractive than maybe a more complicated show that's not going to be able to deliver till November. It has to all be about the idea. We're not going to commission something just because it's available. We're only going to commission things that are right for our our channels. I don't want the delivery, the COVID sort of safe delivery thing to become the most important thing, because actually the most important thing is the content. Fantastic. Helen, thank you for spending so much time with us. Really appreciate your insight. And as I say, we'll post that link to the commissioning website on the episode description so everybody can get in touch. And if anybody wants to produce an all-female trawler crew show, get in touch with me and then I'll, I'll get in touch with Helen and, uh, and we'll be away. Absolutely. All the best. Stay safe. Hope to speak to you and see you in real life very soon. Thanks very much, Justin. It was lovely to chat to you. And now it's time in the show to welcome once again, Tracy Forsyth, our wellbeing expert. Tracy, hello. How are you doing? I'm very well, Justin. How are you? I'm all right. I'm good. I'm good. It's a sunny day. It was so lovely to see on Sunday the um, snow and everybody's excitement in London. I don't know whether it was snowing near you, but we had snow in London for the first time in what seems like years. And it was like Christmas Day or something. Everybody, adults and kids alike, were so excited. I've never seen so many snowmen in the park. It was incredible. That's right. It was true, actually. And it was something that helped sort of break up the monotony of the day-to-day life because obviously with lockdown a lot of the days you can say a lot of the days are actually very much the same aren't they it's difficult to break out of this sort of daily routine we're all in it is and I think it's just just a, a reminder that nature just has this incredible power to delight us in a way that we just just don't realize I mean even my husband was you know so excited about the snow so wonderful wonderful stuff What are we talking about this week, Tracy? Well, so this week, I want to talk about what it's like to be a self-critical overachiever. The reason being is I, I was thinking about this and I thought, oh, you know what? The tribe I love coaching and mentoring most are what I call the SCOA, Self Critical Overachievers. Now, of course, a true self-critical overachiever won't actually self-identify as one because they don't believe they overachieve. In fact, I was talking about this to somebody and they said, hang on a minute, what about the uh, not critical enough underachiever? And I thought, (laughs) I rest my case. 
So <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody's listening and um, want to know whether they are said self-critical overachiever, this is my these are my criteria. So Justin, I want you to play along with me, and I want you to tell me how many out of these five you identify with. Number one, you are simultaneously excited and terrified by big challenges, thinking, I'm never going to be able to do that. But when you've achieved said big challenges, you throw them over your shoulder, never to be looked at again. You take it for granted that you did it. You don't even see it as an achievement. Number two, you compare yourself negatively to others and find yourself wanting why aren't I like X? If only I were more like Y. I wish I had Z's qualities whilst being completely blind to all the things you yourself are amazing at. Number three, you look at what you haven't done instead of what you have done, what you haven't achieved instead of what you have, where you still have to get to instead of how far you've come. Number four, Despite having experience and expertise in your field, you find it very hard to sell yourself without feeling either that you're boasting or more likely fearing that you're an imposter. And last but not least, when things go wrong, you treat yourself in a way that you would never treat a friend. You berate yourself, are mortified by your, by your behavior, and you kick yourself. So, Justin, mm. am I mm. right? Do you identify... I, ident I identify with at least three of those. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and would you have, are you happy with the label, I am a self-critical overachiever? I think so, generally. I think I think particularly the, the point about the t being terrified and yeah. excited at the same time about, a, you know, a big project, a huge project that, that you have coming up. I think it's, being terrified of failure, I suppose it is, isn't it? And then you overcome it. You, it's a great success. Then you're right. It's like, okay, it's brilliant. There's a moment where you think, brilliant, I've achieved that. I feel fantastic about it. And then the next day, it's like, right, it did that. Yeah, did that, done that. Yeah, yeah. Ne never to be looked at again, you know, and it gets bigger and bigger. And, and you know, people in television, like any sort of competitive industry, I think we have a very, very high proportion of self-critical overachievers. So, and, and I know this because I was a self-critical overachiever. Now I like to think that I'm an overachiever without the self-criticism. Yeah. And it's fantastic. I am, I, I am proud to boldly say that I'm an overachiever. What do I mean by that? How do I exist? Well, I now love what I do and I know what I want. I'm able to wholeheartedly champion others, including rivals or competitors in my field, and celebrate others' successes without feeling rubbish about myself. I understand and I'm proud of my assets and abilities, and I'm able to sell myself fearlessly without feeling like an imposter. And I understand that when things go wrong, I will inevitably go through a horrible process until I feel okay about it all. It still can be very painful, but I know it will pass. And I think it's just that, you know, nowadays I know that I'm not perfect and that's OK. And I, I suppose it's my wish that I want all those super talented, self-critical overachievers just to drop the self-criticism bit, which is easier said than done. Here are some of my broad tips. You know, how did I get here? Well, certainly age and experience helps you know i'm now 51 i'm proud to be 51 i think the best is the best is yet to come um i took serious note of what energizes me and what drains me and i've adjusted my life accordingly next thing i did is i decided i wasn't going to be modest for society's sake uh, that i was going to celebrate my assets and not worry so much about the things i'm not i'm not perfect and that's okay I spent time also getting 100% clarity on what moves and drives me and what impact I want to have in life. And that's what I measure myself against. And I decided to act on what I wanted, not to wait for permission or for the approval of others. So now that's why I, I love working with self-critical overachievers, because in coaching or mentoring, you can take people on that process to, to get them to shed that self-criticism and see themselves in the true sort of resplendent glory that they truly are. 
And it's just, I want to say to people in this industry, you know, I see you, I champion you, you are amazing. So don't be hard on yourself and enjoy what you have. Is this a process, Tracy, that you take people through? It is a process. You know, we look at, as all those things, values, motives, drivers, energizers, de-energizers, and look really closely at the inner critic and that limiting chat that you have. But also, so it is a process that you go through in coaching and mentoring. And actually, just to just to let people know, I am just about to launch a virtual online academy, virtual online, it's the same thing, um, called Fast Track to Fearless. And it's going to be dedicated to 100% career confidence and fearless leadership. So I'm actually doing a very, a, a free mini series on defeating imposter syndrome. And if you head to fasttracktofearless.com, you will be able to download my free mini series on defeating imposter syndrome. So that is just one of the, the first, first ways you can do to drop the self-critical from your overachieving self. We'll put a link in the episode description to Fast Track to Fearless. Tracy, thank you. That's great advice. And, and I'm sure people can really benefit from going through this process. Look forward to speaking again very soon. Thank you for having me. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our new free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, exclusive insight and opinion, including the secret producer, our intrepid anonymous exec, reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Lockdown 3 in London. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.